Hi again, everyone. I'm Mike King, along with Speedway historian Donald Davidson. Welcome to another edition of Indy 500, The Classics. We're here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Hall of Fame Museum, sitting in front of, of course, the famed Borg Warner Trophy. And today, Donald, we're talking about the 1966 race. It was an era where we were seeing increased speeds and fewer and fewer front-engine cars. The rear-engine cars were here to stay. Absolutely. In fact, uh, only one will make the race that you're about to see, 1966. The speeds are going up. Uh, it's the, the early days of the so-called tire wars. Uh, Goodyear had been in it uh, since 1963, uh, but this was the first year where they were really kind of even, and uh, the, the uh, lot of tire testing going on year-round, and the speeds kept going up. How fast officially? Well, let's take a look and see. The future for Roger Ward is now. He won in 1959, again in 1962, and hates to qualify. After missing the show last year, he is determined to win a spot in the 50th 500 starting field. A happy champion, first man to qualify. And 7,500 seconds. On the track, Graham Hill from London turns four laps at an average of 159.243 miles per hour. The European road racing champion took his first look at the speedway in 1963, but did not enter the race. Now he has won a place in the 1966 500. The national champion, Mario Andretti, drove one unofficial lap of 168 miles per hour during morning practice on the first day of qualification. An hour later, he has to do it all over again. And this time, the pressure is on. Whatever speed he makes is official, and his starting position for the race hangs in the four-lap performance. He must make this record under the watching eyes of more than 200,000 first-day racing fans. His fastest lap is 166.328, a new all-time official track record. The four-lap average is 165.899. Mario Andretti has put the pole starting position almost beyond the reach of his competition. A Scotsman named Jimmy Clark came to Indianapolis last year and did quite well. He won the race. Now, another Scotsman tries his luck. Jackie Stewart, a rookie driver, makes the field on the first day. His speed, 159.972. Finally, Jones was the first man in history to break the 150 mile per hour barrier in qualification. That was in 1962. Now, Four years later, his qualifying speed reflects a 12 mile per hour increase. The four lap average is 162.484. The former winner will start in the second row. Jim McElreath was third man in the 1965 national point standings. Now in a new car and in a new year, he qualifies for the biggest event on the championship trail. His average speed is 160.908 miles per hour. snowballs into a jolting crash for A.J. Foyt. He climbed from the car unhurt, but Foyt will not qualify today. Afternoon winds slow down qualifications. Jimmy Clark, last year's winner, waits until very late in the day for the best track conditions. He is mindful of the speed he must attain to win the pole position, and he's been there before. His speed climbs into the 164 mile per hour bracket, a full mile an hour slower than Andretti's speed. Clark takes the checkered flag and pulls in. He will start the race in the middle of the front row. 164.144.
next day, a very thoughtful A.J. Foyt considers the situation. The best starting positions are gone, and waiting for the second weekend will only put him further back in the field. In a spare car, he takes to the track and turns 161.355, but he's very, very careful about how close he drives to the short shoot wall. Suddenly, in the main straightaway, it's Bob Byte on fire. A split gas line ignites, and Byte pulls to the inside as emergency equipment paces him around the track. Rubber fuel cells protect the gas supply. The blaze is confined to the back of the car. Byte stands up in the cockpit as emergency crew teamwork gets the fire out before the car is stopped. Knepper on the track qualifies at 159 plus miles per hour. Take a good look while you can at a modern day antique. Bobby Grimm qualifies the only front engine roadster to make the race. The field fills up. Only a few places are left. Al Unser, teammate of Jimmy Clark, qualifies for his second 500. He posts the fastest time of the day, 162.272, and gets congratulations from Dad Unser. Time grows short, and drivers try to find a place in the fastest field in history. The colorful, noisy Novi cars have been a part of the Indianapolis scene for many years, but this is the end of an era. The hopes and dreams of some are lost in crumpled metal. Others find their defeat in the irrevocable figures on a timing clock. But the field is filled. There are 33 men and machines ready to start the 50th 500. So we're all ready to go with the 1966 500. Mario Andretti on the pole with a new track record. He brings them down for the start, and unfortunately, it won't go as smoothly as we would like. So let's go now to the brickyard for the running of the 1966 Indianapolis 500. Now, ladies and gentlemen, at the starting line, the Peugeot. The In 1916, Dario Resta drove this Peugeot to victory. Even then, a trend toward body streamlining was evident, but it took another half century to produce these modern-day shapes of the future. Nine days in May have flown by. The fastest 33 men and cars have been selected. And now the whole month, in fact a year of work, will be reviewed in a matter of hours to determine what magic concept in speed will direct the trend of the future.
track is open in the middle. One, two, three, four, five, six cars perhaps. A car hit the wall on the outside as just as the field got the green flag. The red flag is out and the race has been stopped here at the very start. We will get you a complete report of the cars and drivers involved as soon as possible. of the field is gathered here at the starting line, and we will begin now to give you a rundown throughout the track area of the cars that are here at the starting line, which means the cars that definitely are not involved in the accident at the south end of the straightaway. First of all, Graham Hill in car number 24. Stunned, the drivers wait for the track to be cleared. There were no injuries. There was one fire caused by a broken gas line, but rubber fuel cells protecting the gas supply in each car averted what could have been a fiery disaster. The race is restarted, but one third of the field is missing. Before even one lap is run under the green flag, there is more trouble. Johnny Boyd leaves his car against the first turn wall. George Sally's beautiful speed creation joins the growing pile of battered cars. Again, the green flag, and again, trouble. Jimmy Clark has passed Mario Andretti, and Andretti has car problems. the situation will improve, but it doesn't. After one trip into the pits for fresh plugs, Andretti is forced to accept the fact that the race he hoped to win will go to someone else. getting the bad news in the pits. Attention is shifted to the back straightaway. Chuck Hulse and George Snyder tangle coming off turn two, and the field of cars scramble wildly to get around the wrecks. With the wrecks cleared away, the race settles down, at least for the moment. Jimmy Clark leads. Lloyd Ruby is second. And Parnelli Jones is third. In the pits, Clark's crew prepares for the first of two routine pit stops, which every car must make. Clark comes through turn four. Well, he was going to make a pit stop anyway. Clark comes in for routine service and damage inspection. The lead passes to Lloyd Ruby. But with the caution light on, others make their mandatory pit stops. Jackie Stewart is in and out in a hurry. Then Graham Hill. And Lloyd Ruby, relinquishing the lead to Clark again. For Roger Ward, it was not a pit stop. Mechanical problems made at the end of the race and the end of a 20-year racing career. A champion retires and walks into history. Now Clark leads, and Lloyd Ruby trails by 19 seconds. Clark has only to maintain his speed and scheduled pit stops to win the race. But Clark spins again, this time in turn three. He makes an unscheduled pit stop for inspection, and the shoe is on the other foot. Lloyd Ruby now has the lead. In 
turn three, Harley Jones slows down and climbs out. Bearing failure on the left front wheel puts the former winner out of the race on the 87th lap. This office is closed for the day. At the midway point, Ruby holds his lead over Clark. Finally, Ruby comes in for his second scheduled pit stop. Clark moves into the lead, up by a very slim margin. and four laps later, catches Clark at the start of the main straightaway. Ruby takes the lead and Clark is second, but he needs fuel and must come in. This puts him in a position of having to worry about holding second place, for Jackie Stewart is moving up rapidly. by Ruby Ann Stewart. He drops back and is passed by Jackie Stewart. And Lloyd Ruby starts to slow down, losing oil. Ruby comes in after leading the race for 68 laps. The gentleman from Texas draws a round of applause from the crowd. Two Scotsmen, one Englishman, Al Unser, and Jim McElreath dominate the race. It's Al Unser at the beginning of the main straightaway. He climbs out unhurt, but his hopes of finishing his second Indianapolis 500 are gone. Graham Hill passes Jimmy Clark. But Clark thinks that Hill is still a lap behind. What Clark doesn't know is that earlier, on Clark's first spin, Hill had already quietly slipped up in the confusion. Jackie Stewart begins to slow down. His oil pressure is almost gone. Only a few laps left to go, and all he has to do to win is finish. But it's not to be. The car quits in the backstretch, and the rookie Scotsman heads for the finish line on foot. Just a few laps from the finish. He tours the track smoothly and takes the checkered flag. The Meekham Racing Team holds a celebration. Graham Hill and car number 24 is the new. Jimmy Clark is second. He pulls in to be congratulated by Jackie Stewart. And Jim McElreath is third. The race is ended, and Graham Hill of London, England, pulls into victory lane. What kind of a man is he? And does he compare with the preconceived image of what an Indianapolis winner should be? Well, hardly. To start with, he's the calmest man in victory lane, and is a little puzzled by all the confusion. He looks like an English businessman, and didn't learn to drive a car until he was 23. But this great ambassador of auto racing was the 1962 world champion and is the first Indianapolis rookie driver to win since 1927. It is traditional for the Indianapolis winner to drink a cold bottle of milk in Victory Lane. Jackie Stewart certainly did not win. Maybe he likes milk, or just possibly he's getting in practice 
for the future. So Graham Hill is the winner of the 1966 Indianapolis 500, and Donald, he becomes one of the few Englishmen to take the checkers here. Yeah, also a real surprise. Uh, I don't think anybody expected Graham Hill to win it going in, and indeed, as you saw, he just came up and led the last 10 laps only. Uh, that's not the fewest number of laps uh, ever by a winner, but it's close. And also, that was just about the end of the front engine cars. Uh, Bobby Graham out in the first lap. Uh, in 1967, there would be none, and then 68, we'd have one more front engine car, and that was it. So changing times here at the Speedway during those uh, middle 60s. Well, that will do it for another edition of Indy 500, the classics. For Donald Davidson, I'm Mike King. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you next time.